So the internet is running out of IP addresses. <laughs> You've heard it all before. But it's real this time. So what makes it real this time is IANA allocated the last five slash eight blocks in February to the regional registries. Uh, it turns out the May Mayans foretold this <laughs> right there. <laughs> so what about NAT? I thought NAT was going to save us from all this. Um, there's two big issues with NAT. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, NAT is when you take a whole bunch of computers and put them behind a single IP address. So there's two big issues with this. Um, with NAT, as NAT gets bigger and bigger and bigger, geolocation and abuse prevention become huge challenges. Uh, let me just illustrate this. Under normal circumstances, every computer on the internet connects directly to your website. That means you know exactly where those computers are, and you can target things at them. Ads, content, uh, local preferences. But with NAT, you put many computers behind a single IP address. Uh, as a matter of fact, one ISP is going to start at 1,000 computers behind each IP address. Uh, this has some pretty serious ramifications. Best case, you can narrow a computer down to a county instead of a city. Worst case, there's no geolocality with this NAT, and this is the amount of resolution you're going to get. So this is going to have a pretty profound impact on revenue models, on targeting, uh, and on content. Uh, abuse is another challenge. So today, if there's a bad actor out there, uh, you can target that single bad actor, and you can take them out. With NAT, with 1,000 or 10,000 computers behind uh, an IP address, uh, it's difficult to do that kind of targeting, and there's a lot of collateral damage. So what's the answer? You know, skip the NAT with IPv6. IPv6 is great. There's 128 bits of address. That's more numbers than I can calculate on, uh, in my head on the stage right now. Um, so why don't we just all use IPv6? But there's a catch. So number one, IPv6 adoption. So this stadium here holds 100,000 people. And out of that 100,000 people, if you were to take a survey of the internet, 200 of them would have IPv6. That's about that many. I counted. Here's the other issue. If I'm running a dual stack site and a user is connecting to my site, if that user is part of the 99.8% that have only IPv4, it's great. They continue to use IPv4. They're happy. They get my site. Uh, you know, they don't see a difference. I see a difference because I don't know where they are, but they don't see a difference. And if they have IPv6 and it's working, that's good too. They get my site over IPv6. They can see my content. I know exactly where they are. I can target them if they're a bad actor. Life is good. But this isn't the case for everybody. Some people have IPv6, but it's broken. And if they have IPv6 and it's broken, they can't see my site, because browsers on the internet prefer IPv6. And so they're going to see that IPv6 route. They're going to try to use that IPv6 route, but they're not going to be able to get to my site. It gets worse. There's timeouts set in the operating systems, the major operating systems, uh, for browsers and OSs to fail back to IPv4. But these timeouts are pretty long. So quad A record, that's a location record in IPv6. It takes place of an A record in IPv4. In Windows, if you don't get a quad A, or if you get a quad A record back but you can't connect, it's going to wait 21 seconds before it retries. Same timeout for Linux. OS 10, 75 seconds. Uh, iOS doesn't, doesn't fall back. Uh, to make matters worse, most websites have actually two or three quad A records, because they have two or three data centers out there. And so you multiply these numbers by the number of quad A records that your site's putting out there. So not, not the best uh, user experience. And just to give an idea of the magnitude of the problem, you remember this stadium with the 200 users who had uh, IPv6? Out of those, more than one in 10 of those are broken. That's almost half a million users on the internet. It's a huge problem. So this poses sort of a chicken and egg problem. Because we've got these users out there. There's enough users that websites care about them. So nobody really wants to go first 
and write off those users. But by the same token, if none of the websites enable IPv6, if none of the websites enable dual stack, and, and none of the websites can enable the kind of advanced features and, and geolocation that's gonna come with IPv6, then the users aren't gonna have any reason to wanna to switch to IPv6. And the ISPs are gonna, aren't gonna have any reason to wanna to support IPv6. So this was the beginning of IPv6 day. The answer was, everybody is gonna go first. So 434 participants signed up for IPv6 day, and I, I forget how many websites it is, thousands of websites, um, signed up for IPv6 day. Yahoo's one of them. And what IPv6 day was, it was a, uh, a day on June 8th of this year when major websites turned on IPv6 dual stacking for 24 hours uh, from 00 UTC to 00 UTC, June 8th. So let's talk about how Yahoo implemented this. We decided that the uh, site we wanted to dual stack was www.yahoo.com. Now, yahoo.com, it's a little bit complicated, but the single infrastructure serves 37 markets. Uh, and so we were targeting all 37 of those markets with IPv6 day. And we serve it from a colo footprint of uh, 10 sites worldwide. And so the first thing that we did was we stood up a bunch of IPv6 proxies. Now the reason we did that is that the state of IPv6 in, in network gear, the state of IPv6 in our code, the state of IPv6 in proxies, it's all a little bit unknown. And, and we perceived that there was a fair amount of risk to just turning on IPv6. Uh, you know, nobody knew really what was gonna happen when we turned it on and we got any kind of uh, you know, noticeable traffic. And so what we decided to do is we decided to split our traffic. We decided to direct all of the IPv6 traffic to these proxy locations where we would turn it into IPv4 traffic, annotate it with a source IP address, and then send it back to our main serving infrastructure. And then for the IPv4 traffic, we sent that the normal route back to our serving infrastructure. So seven IPv6 proxy locations. Um, other stuff we had to do. Uh, we had to install six to four relays in all of our peering points. Six to four is a tunneling protocol uh, out on the web and it's, it's a voluntary participation tunneling protocol. Basically what happens is um, I stand up a relay, you stand up a relay, I connect to my relay over IPv6, uh, but there isn't an IPv6 route all the way through the internet. So my relay turns it into an encapsulated IPv4 uh, communication, sends it over to your relay, your relay turns it back into IPv6 and sends it onto a site. And then the site comes back via the same path, but maybe not because all of the relays are, are anycasted. And so which relay gets picked on the route out versus the route back is, is completely random. and, and ha the route out has nothing to do with the route back. So what we discovered was the route back didn't always work as well as we'd like it to. We couldn't always answer all of the packets that came to us. So we stood up our own six to four relay infrastructure in all of our peering points. Uh, we also certified all our network gear at scale and the stuff that didn't make the cut, we didn't put it in the, in the uh, proxy locations. Uh, the translation from 32 bit addresses to 128-bit addresses uh, tickled a bunch of our code uh, in, in ways that we had to go and retrofit it. And so Yahoo runs their own uh, private DNS service. It's a custom DNS service that does uh, global load balancing and it has all kinds of functionality behind it that's specific to Yahoo. So we had to retrofit that. Uh, we had to retrofit our, our denial of service protection layer. We, we run a denial of service protection layer as well. So we had to retrofit that to, to understand IPv6 addresses and understand what they meant. Uh, retrofit our audience data pipeline. So we take all of our page view data and we put it into this giant pipeline and, and draw conclusions from it. And so we had to make that be able to handle IPv6 as well. So just lots of stuff that we had to deal with in order to prepare for IPv6. And in fact, the planning for this started way in advance. Uh, I think the denial of service work and the DNS work started almost a year ahead of IPv6 day. Customer outreach, the other thing that we really wanted to do was we wanted to let our customers know what was coming. And so to do this, we put two beacons on our homepage. One beacon that did an IPv4 test and one beacon that did an IPv6 test. If we were able to detect that a user's IPv6 connection was broken, 
Uh, we do what's called a window shade, which is a, a little advertisement that comes down from the top of the page and tell them you're broken and click here for more help. Uh, and we have help pages in, in 38 languages. Uh, just in case you can't see it, the window shade is there. And here's our help page, and there's a big button in the middle that says start IPv6 test. This was pretty cool because when you click this, it takes you to a page where it'll test your IPv6 connection, tell you what's wrong with it, and tell you what you can do to fix it. Uh, and so we had this in 38 languages in 38 different countries. Um, and then the other thing we did to prepare was we did two 15-minute test runs uh, prior to the big day. And so we did one, the first one we did at a low traffic time, 10 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, May 31st. And the second one we did in the middle of the day because we wanted to test it at scale. But the important thing was these were 15 minutes. So what did we learn? So when we turned on the first test run, this is what we saw. And um, so just quick explanation of what you're looking at here. What this is, is this is a traffic distribution graph. This is all of the traffic coming from India. And the different colored sections there is the amount of that traffic being served by each of the Yahoo data centers, well, three of the Yahoo data centers. So the purple line is India. That means traffic that came from India was served by India. And the green and yellow lines are two different data centers in Santa Clara. And so we turned on the code, and this is what we saw. And um, needless to say, we had a reaction to this. But back to the graph, what happened was that the DNS health checks, our DNS infrastructure is, uh, it, it health checks in, in Asia and it health checks in, in the US and it health checks all the different colos. And, and if it discovers that it's in a state that it doesn't think that it can recover from, it falls back to a default rotation, uh, which, includes the Indi it, which includes the US, but it doesn't include India. And so that's what you're seeing here is the stuff that remained in India is, is due to caching, probably RFC violations. Um, but the stuff that failed over is the well-behaved clients that actually did the DNS lookup, saw that the site had moved and, and moved all the traffic to the US. And this, this is a big problem for us, not so much from a content perspective. If you look, the, the top of this graph doesn't move. Uh, and it doesn't move because we didn't actually lose any traffic. There wasn't any real incident. But what it does impact is it impacts latency because now users in India, rather than connecting to a colo in Mumbai, are connecting to a colo in Santa Clara. So lesson number one, monitoring isn't the same in a dual stack environment. Uh, at this point, I'd like to talk about another thing that we did to prepare for IPv6 day. So we had a really long conversation about when things would be bad enough that we had to roll back. And this was a complicated conversation because we really didn't want the egg in the face of saying, yeah, 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 we're gonna do it. And then rolling back and saying, well, we were just kidding. You know, we, we weren't committed. So, so we had a, a long discussion about when are we gonna roll back? When are things bad enough that, that we have to, you know, pull the, pull the, pull the plug on this one and, uh, and roll back to IPv4. And, and what we decided among other things is we decided so IPv6 traffic, 0.2%, you're never gonna see that in a traffic dra graph, but we decided, well, things got bad enough that we saw a 5% traffic drop, you know, that's significant, we're gonna roll back. So fast forward, test number two. Hey, what do you know, 5% traffic drop. <laughs> now this is what we saw, and, and we had a lot of debate about this, because if you look at this graph carefully and you kinda squint, the 5% traffic drop, we turned on IPv6 at at two o'clock, at 1400, and if you look at this graph, the traffic drop actually starts just a little bit before two o'clock, and so we talked about that a little bit, and you know, is this a real problem? Is this something that happened you know, by itself and, and had nothing to do with IPv6? Turns out, we showed ourselves a week over week graph, and it happens every day. The red line is the previous week, the blue line is, is this week. So lesson number two. Don't start something big and risky at a traffic inflection point. <laughs> so now the big day came on. Uh, we started it up, actually we started it up, we picked a prime number. We started at 17 minutes before the hour on June 8th. Um, and, and this is what we saw in the UK. 
And it looks pretty good. This is the same graph. It's a traffic distribution graph. The purple line, I think, is UK, and the green line is probably Switzerland. I'm not sure exactly what the countries are, but you know, it doesn't look like anything changed, right? But then we took a look at the RIPE, address, uh, the RIPE graphs, and, and RIPE is the, the uh, regional internet registry in Europe. They were, they were running uh, tests for us, and this is what they saw, 75 millisecond increase in latency. So this is concerning. Um, and the reason that we didn't detect this is that they happened to be in the right place to see this problem, but it was so small that we couldn't see it in the overall traffic patterns. So lesson number three, always have more than one way to look at things. And finally, uh, the morning of June 8 Pacific time, which is well into the test, we woke up, came in, and this is what we saw. So uh, nobody needed any caffeine this morning. As a matter of fact, we all looked like that. <laughs> Turns out this was a, this was a red herring. Uh, what this was was we, we dropped a router in Los Angeles. Um, and the router, the loss of the router blocked the monitoring traffic from our site to our monitoring nodes. And so as a result, it looked like this, but when we went on on the, on the nodes that were serving themselves, uh, there was no change. So lesson number four, always have more than one way to look at things. <laughs> and lesson number five, practice makes perfect. So for a major change like this, schedule a couple test runs you know, make sure you get comfortable with it. Make sure you learn some things from the test runs. Because honestly, the events that happened on the first test run and the second test run, if they had happened on World IPv6 Day, there's a really good chance we would have had to roll back. And, and we would have had some explaining to do if we, if we did that. So I've got a lot of stats, but I'm out of time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly through those. So overall adoption, just under 0.2% is what we saw, uh, a little bit less than I think what was, what was expected. Regional breakdown, uh, Europe was way better than the United States or Asia. Uh, and the reason for this is France. Uh, we saw 16% IPv6 penetration rate in France. So finally, in conclusion, um, did it work? So here's a Twitter feed from somebody. Uh, he's ready to throw his MacBook out the window. But if you fast forward, he actually succeeded. He went to the help page, he tested his IPv6, he found out what was wrong, and he fixed it. So that's one down, 439,999 to go. <laughs> so I'll leave you guys with, with a call to action. So if you run a site, try out IPv6. It's, it's hard. There's a lot of moving pieces there. There's a lot of things you have to do to make it work with your site. And, and you want to be ready when it does happen. And if you're an ISP, Make it work for your users. It's, it's not OK that 10% that of the users on the internet are broken right now using IPv6. Our goal is to make it so everybody in this stadium has IPv6 and can access the internet over it. That's all I got.